Hello and good afternoon, everyone. My name is Winnie Sibilak, and I am the Senior Marketing Manager here at Dreger, and I am so excited for you to be in attendance. So let me go ahead and introduce our speaker for today. It is my pleasure to have Dr. Ben Daxton with us. Dr. Daxton completed medical school at the University of Oklahoma and his internship and residency in anesthesiology on active duty with the U.S. Army at Walter Reed National Military Medical Center in Bethesda, Maryland. He served one year as a staff anesthesiologist at Walter Reed before being stationed in Lapstuhl, Germany at their regional medical center. While there, he served as chair of the OB anesthesia as well as at the PACU director and eventually vice chair of the department. In 2016, he volunteered for a deployment to Afghanistan and served as the medical director for the primary NATO hospital in Kabul. He was awarded the Meturius Service Medal for his efforts, and Dr. Daxton separated from the Army in 2017 as a major and worked at Mayo Clinic before completing a critical care fellowship and being awarded Chief Fellow in 2018. He has since served as the Associate Program Director for the Anesthesiology Critical Care Medicine Fellowship, Assistant Director for the Mayo Clinic Respiratory Care Program, and is the Anesthesia Representative on the Critical Care Independent Multidisciplinary Programs Division for Education. In 2022, he took over as Program Director for the ACCM Fellowship. He splits his time between the ICU and the OR, working primarily in the transplant ICU and the neuroanesthesia division, respectfully. He actively researched mechanical ventilation and routinely contributes to Ask Mayo Experts advisory content for critical care. First off, I wanna thank you for your service and please, let's go ahead and start our program. Dr. Daxon. Great, Winnie, thank you very much, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you and see your slides. Beautiful, okay. Well, as Winnie said, uh, we're a little behind schedule. I'll skip some of the pleasantries and just get right into it, but I do wanna say thank you to Winnie and Ed and everybody else at Drager for allowing me to speak today. Uh, it's a topic near and dear to my heart and it's APRV, uh, so let's get into it. Uh, we're gonna talk about uh, a different way to think about the mode uh, beyond lung protective ventilation. Uh, I have no disclaimers. Um, before we talk about APRV, I think it's important that we talk about how we talk about APRV. Uh, here's a review article that looked at 30 years of APRV and showed multiple different ways that APRV was used, that these all got lumped together as if they're synonymous. Looking at these waveforms, you can tell these are drastically different ways to apply what everybody is saying the same thing, uh, but obviously they're not. Uh, it's a bunch of different types of fruit getting mixed up. Um, and we all talk like it's the same thing. Uh, this is reflected in the literature. Here are two case reports where they talk about patients that were put on APRV and disaster ensued thereafter, but nowhere in either case report do they talk about uh, the settings. You would never put somebody um, on, let's say, SIMV, have badness ensue, and then say, well, it was the fault of SIMV, and never tell anybody what the settings were. If you found out that they switched somebody from volume control to SIMV and then on SIMV put them on 20 milliliter per kilogram tidal volumes, you wouldn't say it was the fault of the mode, but of the operator. Yet this stuff is ubiquitous in the literature regarding APRV. Uh, so it's not the wand, it's the wizard. And uh, again, we talk about APRV versus all these other modes, but we're really not comparing APRV to other modes. What we're comparing it to is ARDSnet or lung protective ventilation. It's a way to use another mode versus APRV. So one is uh, APRV is a tool compared to another way to use a tool. They're two different categories. It's categorical error. So just in talking about APRV, uh, we're kind of tripping over ourselves and uh, it ends up being a bunch of nonsense. So uh, going forward, I think it would be helpful if we kind of defined, again, what specifically we're talking about and try and bring some clarity to this confusing topic. So as we talk about APRV, it's not going to be ARDSnet versus APRV, which again is a protocol versus a mode, it's going to be a protocol versus another protocol. And the protocol that we're going to use for APRV is called TCAV, or Time Controlled Adaptive Ventilation. So I told you this talk is APRV, we're going to talk about it as being something other than lung protective ventilation, 
So again, to be more precise, it's not APRV beyond lung protective, it's TCAV beyond lung protective. Again, we're talking about a specific way to use this mode. So what is TCAV? Well, TCAV utilizes APRV, which is basically two floating CPAP valves, and they alternate back and forth. So you have to have a set pressure for each valve and then how much time you spend at each valve, and then you go back and forth. And then of course you have to set your FiO2 as you do with any other mode. So here's what uh, it looks like if you have it up on the ventilator. I'll spend just a few seconds on this because it's important to orient you if you're not familiar with it. Uh, you have these release breaths, which I've highlighted here in pink. Uh, and this is called a release phase where pressure drops out and there's kind of bulk flow. And this is where the majority of your ventilation happens. That's followed by a CPAP phase where patients can breathe however they want, spontaneously, uh, or they can be paralyzed. Again, in each one of these phases, the release phase or the CPAP phase, you have the engagement of one of the two CPAP valves. So again, you just have to set whatever the pressure is for that phase and how long you're gonna be in that phase. You put both of them together and that's one respiratory cycle. If you look down at the bottom uh, graph there, uh, those red markings, that's your flow. And you can see a release breath is gonna look different than spontaneous breaths. And we'll get into that in a minute. Um, so uh, APRV following a TCAV protocol is going to follow a simple mantra, and that's stabilize the alveoli, then rescue FRC. This is kind of a crude way to think about it, but for introductory purposes, I think it's helpful to simplify it. To use APRV and TCAV to follow this mantra, stabilize the alveoli, then rescue FRC, we're going to manipulate each one of those CPAP valves in a specific way, and each valve kind of helps with one of these two things. So to stabilize the alveoli, we're gonna manipulate the lower CPAP valve, and then to rescue the uh, um, rescue FRC, or functional residual capacity, we're gonna manipulate the higher CPAP valve. So let's drill in on each one of those. So to stabilize the alveoli, your P low is always going to be equal, is always going to equal zero. Uh, this tends to cause a lot of angst for people. I'll explain why it shouldn't in a minute. And then the T low, is perhaps the most important setting in the entire scheme we're gonna talk about here. And the T-low is equal to the time it takes for the expiratory flow during a release breath, or during that release phase, to decay by 25%. I'm gonna say that again. Your T-low, or how long you spend at that lower pressure of zero, is equal to the decay in expiratory flow. And once that decay, uh, once the flow decays by 25%, you go back up to the CPAP phase, back up to that higher valve, the P low ends. So if your expiratory flow, say, comes out at a whopping 100 liters a minute, you would take as much time at that P low of zero until the flow had decreased to 75 liters a minute. So your peak expiratory flow decreases by 25% to an end expiratory flow. Uh, 60 and 40 are more realistic numbers that you'll see with TCAV. So if you had a peak expiratory flow of 60 liters a minute, the T low would be the amount of time it takes the expiratory flow in that release breath to decay by 25% to 45 liters a minute. Okay. So if you go back to uh, that initial graph I showed you, Again, I have things labeled out here. You would down at the bottom at your flow and see what the peak flow is coming out. And then you would monitor to see how long it took the flow to decay by 25% and get to 75% of that peak flow. Once it does, your T low is done, your release phase is over, and you jump back up to that higher CPAP valve. So if you looked at the ventilator specifically, you're gonna to have to make an initial guess at what you think it is. Here I've got a T low of 0.5 seconds. It's kind of a standard starting point. You won't know what the actual T low is until you start. Uh, you can make your best guess, but you actually have to measure it on the patient. And so here we have our flow coming out and you can see that that looks like it decays by more than 75%. So what we do is freeze the screen, we roll our cursor up and see that we have a peak flow of 56.1 liters per minute. We then look at how long that took us. Uh, sorry, uh, if you look at the T low there of 0.5 seconds, at the end of 0.5 seconds, our flow is now 32.4 liters a minute. So our flow decayed by more than 75%. So if you took our peak flow of 56.1 liters a minute and watched it decay by 25%, or in other words, once it hit 75% of that initial peak, you would wanna stop the T low, not at 0.5 seconds, 
but at whatever time it takes to get to a flow of 42 liters a minute or greater. So what do you do here? Well, you just shorten the T low. And I'm gonna shorten it to 0.3 seconds, and when we measure it there, sure enough, our flow is 42 liters a minute, and that's an appropriate T low. Anything past that and our flow is decaying by too much and we risk atelic trauma. Here's the clever part about this whole setup. Um, oh, before I get to that, uh, one thing to point out, um, a lot of times when you're dealing with these higher pressures and bigger swings and pressures, you can get some reverberation through the tubing and sometimes you'll get little spikes. You can kind of see there's a, a tall pink spike there at the peak expiratory flow. I have uh, uh, pointed to with the red arrow. Uh, that's an artifact. You wouldn't want to measure there, but want to measure from what the true peak expiratory flow is, which is what I have measured in green. Uh, it's pretty easy to spot. Um, obviously, these gigantic uh, spires on the top of the flow are not what we want to be measuring off of. So here's the clever part of this whole setup. The slope of your expiratory flow, when you have a P low of zero, is directly related to the elastance of the lung. So the steeper the slope, uh, the the, uh, uh, the more elastic the lung is. In other words, the more it wants to recoil. Another way to say that is the steeper the slope, the less compliant the lung is. Elastance and compliance are just uh, you know, reciprocals of each other. Um, so if you start with somebody that has uh, really sick ARDS lungs, they're not gonna have a lot of compliance, they're gonna have a lot of elastance, and their initial flow decay is gonna be quite steep, and so your t low will be fairly short. Over time, as we'll get to in a minute, you're going to recruit the lung, improve the compliance, assuming all else being equal, and what you'll see is that the curve begins to flatten out, and then you need a longer T-low in order to hit that 75% cutoff, right? So the 75% is protocolized, but the amount of time it takes to get to 75% or 25% is personalized, right? It's a protocol that allows for personalization of the mode here, right? And this is perhaps the most important point I can make in this entire presentation. Um, one other thing to point out about this, I think a lot of people get hung up on this, but it's actually quite intuitive to anybody who takes care of COPD patients. If you look at their expiratory flow, it is quite long. You often have to have long expiratory times in order to let the lungs completely empty. And sure enough, you would see that in the slope here. They would have a very uh, flat, shallow slope. So as your lungs are not compliant, as they are not COPD, if they're ARDS and restrictive, you'll see that steep slope. But as you recruit and improve compliance, you'll see the slope flatten out. All right, but again, I told you we're gonna start with a pressure of zero and uh, we don't do that anymore, right? We have to have some type of peak. Well, I always point out, while the pressure may say zero on the machine, you know the pressure inside the lung does not equal zero because when you look at the flow, the flow would never equal zero. And in order for there to be flow out of the lung, there has to be some type of pressure differential. So what is the pressure inside the lung? Well, I can't measure it based off of this. I would have to do an expiratory hole. But sure enough, if you do, you'll see something quite striking. Uh, this comes up all the time where I work. Uh, we use a lot of esophageal balloons. And so patients will have what look like dangerous drops in their pressure. If you look down below, they'll have a negative uh, transpulmonary pressure. And of course, we don't want this. This means our alveoli are collapsing at every, uh, every breath. But you would never measure the pressure in, say, a status asthmaticus. We have these incredible peak inspiratory flows because once you have a lot of flow, your pressure measurements are all off. So what do we do? Well, we stop the flow. We do an expiratory hole. And sure enough, at the top on that yellow line, you can see that the pressure jumps back up, reflecting what the true pressure is inside the lung. And if you look back down at the transpulmonary pressure in this patient who has an esophageal balloon, it's quite strikingly different from what it was before. In other words, most people who are unfamiliar with the mode are quite shocked to see that a uh, substantially negative transpulmonary pressure all of a sudden becomes substantially positive. This is really important because we now live in the age of driving pressure and the magic cut off at 15 and everybody wants to make sure they've got a low driving pressure. Well, if you weren't doing these holds and checking to see what the pressure was and just looked at the big numbers on the ventilator, the macro parameters, what you would probably think initially is that if you set a P high of 30 and all of a sudden drops down to zero, your driving pressure is 30. Obviously, that's not the case here because when you do the expiratory hold and measure, what you see is that instead of 30, you have a driving pressure of 
So that pressure there at the top when we do the expiratory hold is 21.5, not zero as we have set on the ventilator, and certainly not around the 10 that it looks like the yellow line gets all the way down to before the expiratory hold. Uh, what I have found, and there's no data to back this up, this is just uh, anecdotal and uh, my experience, is that your driving pressure is usually anywhere from one half to one third of whatever your P high is. So in this, uh, this patient, they have a P high of 30. Uh, their driving pressure initially is going to be somewhere between a half to a third, so that would be 15 to 10. And sure enough, on this patient, it's 8.5. One of the reasons this uh, is hard for people to understand, understand is because we get so caught up on these macro parameters, uh, but that's really not what we're interested in. We're really interested in, in what's going on at the micro level down at the alveoli, but it's really difficult for us to measure that outside of a lab, and so we use the macro as best we can. But we all intrinsically understand this if you think about blood pressure. Uh, as an intensivist, I'm always worried about tissue perfusion, and I know that at the micro circulation, it can often be quite different from what the macro uh, parameters are telling me. Just because I have a map of 65 doesn't mean that's adequate perfusion for the microcirculation. So if we were to look inside the lungs as we're doing these 75% cutoffs and shortening our T low and following uh, expiratory flows, uh, several studies and several different types of animals and several different types of lung injury models have all shown the same thing. And that is as you allow that T low to go past 75%, you start to see more alveolar collapse. And there's a group out of upstate New York, uh, several of them have presented at Drager before. I'd encourage anybody to go back and look at their uh, uh, seminars. Um, but what this group did was they put a microscope on the uh, lung parenchyma, a high-powered microscope, <coughs> and measured uh, the difference between alveoli at end inspiration at and at end expiration, or how much of the uh, screen was occupied by open alveoli right before release breath, and then right at the end of a release breath as most of the air had come out of, uh, of the lung. And what they found is that if you could cut off that T low at 75% of the peak expiratory flow, you did not see any collapse of the alveoli, or I should say minimal collapse. But once you start going past 75%, to 50% to 25%, you'll start to see some of the alveolar collapse. This is really important because uh, older papers will tell you to go all the way down to 50% instead of 75% for your T low. If you do that, you are risking analect trauma and you're risking analect trauma with big pressure swings, which I think would be even worse than on a conventional ventilatory mode. Uh, the other thing to point out as we've had this whole discussion is this is all occurring in the context of restrictive lung diseases. Uh, you wouldn't do this if it was a obstructive lung disease, say a COPD exacerbation. Uh, that's an entirely different discussion. Uh, one other point I want to make about the 75% cutoff. If lung protective ventilation uses the rule of six milliliters per kilogram, that's inviolable. I think we all agree that's what our standard of care would be. 75% is the inviolable rule of TCAV. You would never go greater than six milliliters per kilogram and call it lung protective ventilation, and you would never go below 75% of your peak expiratory flow on your T low and call it time-controlled adaptive ventilation. That's very, very important, especially if you go back and look at studies I mentioned at the beginning uh, that don't talk about their settings, or if they do, they're using settings very different from what I've just described here. Okay, so that's the first half. We're gonna stabilize the alveoli and then rescue FRC. Uh, rescue FRC is really gonna come about as we manipulate that other CPAP valve, the higher pressure one. Your high pressure is gonna be equal to whatever the plateau pressure is on the previous mode that had a tidal volume of six milliliters per kilogram. So just ballpark figures here. General healthy people have about 15 centimeters, and then the more severe your arms, the more pressure you need, all the way up to 30. It should be uh, worth mentioning that if you do have somebody that needs a plateau pressure greater than 30 on a conventional mode, you should still stick with that pressure in TCAV, even if it's above 30. I'll show you an example in a minute, but we can all remember patients we've taken care of that are super obese, they've got breast implants, they've got 20 liters of fluid on them, and they just need a higher pressure. Their entire lung pressure needs have shifted. And so some studies will tie their hands with APRV 
when they switch them over to the mode and then they drop the pressure. They're not allowing themselves to use the same pressure that they would on a previous mode. And it's an unfair comparison at that point. So a lot of times people complain that APRV uses more pressure and it does, it uses a higher mean airway pressure, but our plateau pressures are never different. The second part of this is how much time do we spend at this higher CPAP valve, the T-high? That's gonna depend on your ventilatory needs. If you've got a healthy patient, typically we start with 5.5 seconds and then we'll see how they breathe and adjust from there. Again, in the context of restrictive lung disease and patients that have uh, severe ARDS, uh, a simple formula would be to take 60 seconds and divide it by the respiratory rate of the previous mode. That's how long each respiratory cycle would be. Subtract from that, what you think the T low would be, and that's how much time is left over for your T high. So if you had a patient with a respiratory rate of say 30 breaths per minute, which is not unheard of in severe ARDS, that would be two seconds per respiratory cycle. If you thought your T low was gonna be 0.3, and again, we make ballpark guesses and then measure once we switch them over to the mode, that would leave you with two seconds minus 0.3 equals 1.7 seconds. That's as complicated as the math will get from here on out, okay? So you would start your T high at 1.7 seconds. An important point to note here, again, older papers will tell you that you wanted to keep that T high a certain amount of time. And while we would like to do that, sometimes you just can't. Sometimes the ventilatory demands of the patient don't allow you to do that. Because if you have too long of a T high, you don't have enough releases and suddenly your CO2 builds up, that puts more strain on the right heart as pulmonary vascular resistance increases and badness can ensue from that. So again, I'd love for my T-high to be as long as possible, but sometimes uh, the patient just won't allow it. Um, one of the things that comes about by using this high pressure, but for a longer period of time, is we take advantage of the microanatomy in the alveoli. Now, we always talk about the alveoli as grapes, and that's a lie. They're not. They're a bunch of interconnected honeycombs. And if you look, there's a bunch of little channels and pores that connect all of them. This is important because there's a different amount of time between the ingress and egress of air into some of these different alveoli. And while it might take a very long time for air to travel down the typical pathway, if you can bypass those channels, either because they're blocked off or because you're using more time, through these other channels of Martin or Lambert or Pores of Khan, you might be able to open up an alveoli that you wouldn't in another traditional uh, vent mode. If you look over on the left there, you can see a, a video uh, zoomed in on the alveoli. You can see one opens up and as it does, the one next to it shrinks, implying that there was some type of connection between the two and the open alveoli uh, was able to kind of share its pressure and volume to its neighboring one through one of these connecting channels. One other thing to note too is uh, here's a recruitment maneuver on a lung. Uh, historically, we would do these 40 for 40, 40 centimeters of water for 40 seconds. We've gone away from that. There's all different types of recruitment maneuvers and I'm not gonna get into the details of that. But suffice it to say, we use much shorter recruitment maneuvers now, especially me as anesthesia in the operating room, because after about 10 seconds, you don't get a lot of bang for the buck. The vast majority of your recruitment comes in those first few moments. And afterwards, you start to get hemodynamic impairment and consequences. But what if instead of a 10 second recruitment maneuver, you could do one for 40 seconds or 40 minutes or 24 hours? If you kept that recruitment maneuver going, yeah, eventually you're gonna recruit more and more lung than you would with just that full uh, 10 seconds. But again, we limit ourselves because we're using these much higher pressures. As I said before, APRV will use a higher mean airway pressure, but I'm not gonna use a different plateau pressure. So in a way it allows for me to apply a gentle, judicious and continuous recruitment maneuver to the lung. Uh, this is really important because what we're trying to do is rescue FRC. Uh, everybody focuses on the pressures that we're using in APRV and TCAV, but I think it's uh, at the expense of ignoring the volumes. It's the volume that really is important and not, and not the pressure. Obviously they both are, but as you increase the pressure, if you can recruit lung, you will drop the pulmonary vascular resistance. And paradoxically, you could get improved cardiac function from that. Um, obviously, not all lung is recruitable. ARDS can enter a fibroliferative phase and you're not gonna get lung back. But I have been quite surprised over the years as I have applied this mode and protocol to various patients who I did not think would recruit or who other clinicians told me were too far gone and a day on APRV and TCAV and suddenly I had a tremendous amount of lung volume back. 
So again, we're trying to get to FRC because that's where our lowest pulmonary vascular resistance is. That's gonna be our best uh, VQ matching. There's tons of benefits to come from that. Um, at a micro level, it's important to open up the alveoli and rescue FRC because as uh, we push this tidal volume or release breath into the lungs, the pressure from one alveoli should be uh, uh, equaled by the pressure in the adjacent alveoli. So the transalveolar wall pressure, if you will, that's not a true term, don't go look that up in a medical textbook, but those two should equal and cancel each other out, right? Um, but if you collapse one of those alveoli, suddenly the pressure in the open alveoli isn't balanced by the pressure in the collapsed alveoli, it, ex uh, it expands and deforms the alveoli in such a way that the strain on the alveoli is quite significant. Uh, this has been talked about quite a bit over the last two decades, but these uh, areas where there's inhomogeneity, where one alveoli is collapsed and another one is open, those are called stress raisers because they raise the stress and strain on the alveoli. And if you do the math, what they found is that the applied pressure to those alveoli can be anywhere from two to four times greater than what the macro parameter is that you think you're ventilating with. So just because you are delivering a 30 centimeter safe plateau pressure, again, the macro parameter, because of those stress raisers inside the lung, it may be two to four times that amount of pressure and strain, which obviously would be quite injurious. And it is, we've all seen this. One other thing to point out too is that ventilator-induced lung injury doesn't happen uniformly throughout the lung. It happens at areas where it's already started and propagates from there in kind of a poor get or scheme. Uh, this occurs both, again, at the macro level, if you do CT scans and you can see that uh, Billy propagates out from areas that have been previously injured, not from healthy areas uh, all throughout the lung. And it's also, again, at the micro level, if you start looking at microscopes and, and doing all the fancy studies, you can see that once you get one tear, it's a domino effect to its neighbors, which then domino effect to others and it ripples out from there. Again, it's really important to stop these propagating uh, nidises before they can begin. So once we've uh, stabilized the alveoli and rescued FRC, we're gonna move to the third mantra. And it seems silly to even say this, but in teaching my fellows in the ICU, I'm oftentimes surprised how few of them actually do this. And that's monitor the patient's breathing. I can't tell you the number of times I've had uh, various people come up to me and say, this doesn't look safe, it can't be comfortable, this patient certainly can't like this. And I say, well, there's a simple solution to that. And they look at me as if I have some magic and I just say, ask the patient. And so we'll turn around and we can ask the patient, thumbs up, thumbs down, how are we doing? And what's wonderful is we can even do this stuff in real time. And sometimes I will do this. I will play around with my P high and I'll just ask the patient, how does your breathing feel now? Uh, this assumes obviously that they're not lies, that they are spontaneously breathing. Uh, but uh, if they can breathe and they don't have a lot of sedation on, they can help you guide your breathing. So when you look at these spontaneous breaths, what you're really looking for is, are they comfortable? Or are they safe? Um, in one study, they had this little uh, uh, grayed out picture here on the right to kind of show people uh, safe versus unsafe breathing patterns. Again, this is kind of qualitative. In general, you want the width of the sinusoidal breath to be greater than the height. The more height you get relative to the width, the more likely it is to be an injurious breath. I'm sure as you're all breathing here now, it's this nice, easy sinusoidal. But if you take quick breaths, one right on top of the other, you can imagine you get these big spikes in pressure and flow, uh, and that would be something you'd want to avoid. What you do at that point uh, depends on what you think is causing it. It could be anxiety, it could be pain. It could be that their lungs are too small and they're trying to open them back up, in which case you may have to paralyze them, cut back on your T high, do more, do more bulk ventilation, and uh, just take some more time to try and recruit lung back. Uh, it's important to note that with these spontaneous breaths, they are true spontaneous breaths. These are not pressure supported breaths. You would not want to add pressure support because as soon as you do, you start to distribute the flow differently in the lungs. You get a decelerating flow pattern if you look on the, uh, on the monitor that's shown there on the right versus the blue there if they're on CPAP and true spontaneous breathing, they will pull the lungs in and the air will distribute differently. Uh, the one thing I'll point out here is tube resist compensation, all the draggers should have this. That is fine to use. Uh, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically, I call it pressure support light. It does the fancy math in the background to figure out what amount of pressure is required to get through the resistance of the endotracheal tube, but no more. 
So it basically tries to mimic what it would be like to breathe without an endotracheal tube, uh, but it doesn't actually support the patient's work of breathing beyond that. Um, for whatever reason, some patients don't tolerate this and sometimes you have to take it off uh, and that's okay. Um, spontaneous breaths, as I mentioned before, are very important compared to uh, ventilatory breaths that are given by the machine because they distribute differently through the lung. Uh, here's one from the anesthesia literature, and you can see on the left an awake, spontaneously breathing patient who's then gone under anesthesia there in the middle. And you can see that the diaphragm moves up with that purple, or the diaphragm, uh, excuse me, is marked by your uh, dotted line there. The color moves up, indicating you've lost a little bit of your lung volume, but still distributed in the typical pattern. But as soon as you paralyze them, as you can see on the far right, suddenly you lose a lot of the dorsal distribution and you get a lot more ventral distribution. Uh, that's important to know because as you look at all of those ARDS CT scans, uh, most of the ARDS or most of the damage is in the dependent region. Yeah, but okay, Dr. Daxon, I'm not going to paralyze every one of my patients. That's fine, but it doesn't matter because if you're still going to deliver a machine breath, you're still going to get that maldistribution. Here's another study, and I've got the uh, PubMed references there on the bottom right. Uh, if you look at a pressure control breath compared to a spontaneous breath, you can see that uh, the red line there is where they were breathing when they were awake. And then once they were put on pressure control, you can see the distribution moves left. In other words, in this study, in this graph, it moves ventrally, just like we saw in that previous uh, figure. And if you think, well, let's just do pressure support. Well, as I talked about before, you're pushing in breath with a decelerating flow rather than pulling in a breath with a sinusoidal flow, and you still have this maldistribution. In fact, in that figure, if you look at the pressure control versus the pressure support breath, there's really not that big of a difference in how those two compare. We've also uh, confirmed this with some EIT studies. Uh, if you look at the bottom two figures there, uh, this shows varying levels of pressure support. So on the bottom right, what's in purple there, if you have a high level of pressure support, you can see you've got a lot more ventral distribution of your gas. That's the white area in the top half of the graph. There's a lot of black in that bottom half or the dorsal distribution. But once you move to a lower amount of pressure support, you can see that there is more distribution in the dorsal region or the dependent region, uh, indicated by more white. Um, additionally, if you can add on more PEEP, that also tends to promote more of a dependent or dorsal distribution. So again, from the same EIT study, if you look at the top there, <clears throat> you can see that as you go from a low PEEP to a high PEEP, there is more ventilation distributed to the dependent portions of the lungs, all right? So what we really want is to get uh, a higher amount of PEEP and a lower amount of pressure support. Sounds like something APRV and TCAV can do. So uh, spontaneous breathing is an entire, it's multiple lectures unto itself. Just a few things. Uh, APRV is oftentimes uh, called CPAP with releases, and I think that's a nice way to think about it. Um, you try and promote spontaneous breathing, but patients can't always spontaneously breathe. As I mentioned, sometimes you'll see injurious patterns. Um, uh, uh, clinical uh, conditions may dictate that they don't spontaneously breathe, and that's okay. But if they can breathe safely, it's quite beneficial. It's how we were meant to breathe. It improves your homogenous, it improves your gas distribution, so it's more homogenous, better VQ matching. You get more dependent gas distribution, as we just talked about. You'll use your diaphragm more frequently and more naturally. That will help with its strength. As you are breathing naturally and your diaphragm is contracting more dorsally, what it does is it envelops the liver and spleen, two sponges of blood, squeezes them, and helps push them up the IVC into the heart simultaneously if you're making a more relatively negative intrathoracic pressure not only are you pushing blood up into the thorax you're also pulling it in from that relatively negative intrathoracic pressure so that helps with venous return uh, we've already talked about rv function uh, uh, this would help with that and obviously uh, there's lots of benefits if you can use decreased sedation okay but is this safe I don't want to get too much into the weeds on this. Again, these are separate, separate talks, but there are a lot of studies coming out showing that if you can use higher levels of PEEP or higher pressure, uh, that it renders a lot of spontaneous efforts not injurious. Again, you can uh, look at the PubMed references down there after the talk if you want to get more into the weeds. There's several reasons why this is as far as opening up the lungs, uh, uh, 
strain on the diaphragm itself. Uh, but needless to say that a lot of evidence is accumulating saying that higher PEEP or higher pressures can help lower the risk of injurious spontaneous breaths. It's not uh, uniform. You always have to monitor your patient's breathing, uh, but this is encouraging for using uh, time-controlled adaptive ventilation. Uh, but the question I get all the time is, uh, is this comfortable, right? I, people tell me, I, I don't want to be uh, breathing while I've got a leaf blower going into base. This is actually somebody uh, I work with here. This was their exact quote. And again, it's not so much the pressure, it's the volume. Sometimes you need the higher pressure in order to maintain that functional residual capacity. It's very uncomfortable to, to breathe below FRC, and we've all experienced this. Anybody who's gotten the wind knocked out of them suddenly has an acute loss of volume, and the first breath or two, you're breathing really hard because you're trying to open that lung back up. Um, you're pulling really hard. You're generating a lot of pressure, but once you can get that volume back, you're a lot more comfortable. Um, uh, one patient I took care of a while ago, I actually gave a talk uh, two years ago uh, to Drager, um, where I talked about my experience uh, volunteering in a COVID ICU. And this is one patient I took care of uh, while I was there. He was on no sedation and he had a P high of 34 with a T high of four seconds. And he wrote uh, there in the bottom half of that letter, the air is good now. I mentioned before, I was curious where this guy's pressure needs were. His chest X-ray looked a little over distended to me. I thought he was well above FRC. But without sedation on, I started manipulating his P-high, and every time I would come down on his P-high, he would immediately wave his hands and, you know, kind of uh, motion something's not right. And without telling him what I was doing, I would just go back up on the P-high, and he immediately would give me the thumbs up. Uh, and if uh, uh, you have a chance, I would encourage everybody just to try it themselves. Um, I do this with all of my fellows. I try and get them set up on a... Uh, 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 on a ventilator here, and we'll just play around with different modes. The one thing to note, you would not put yourself on 30 centimeters of water because you do not have ARDS, right? So I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think in these videos, I was on a P high of maybe 10 or 12, okay? Uh, so CPAP will be your most comfortable mode if you compare, uh, you know, 10 or 20 different types. Uh, and in my opinion, I thought APRV was a close second. Honestly, I'm not blinded. I was pretty sure I knew it was APRV when they tried it on me, but for what it's worth. Okay, so uh, here's what this all looks like if you put it on the Drager ventilator. Uh, now, this patient isn't spontaneously breathing, um, but this looks very similar to that graph I showed you at the start of the presentation. Just one thing I wanted to point out, uh, they've got an, uh, their T-low cut off so that the expiratory flow decreases at 60%. So the one thing I would change on here uh, is just to shorten that T-low so it cuts off at 75%. Uh, two or three noteworthy things I want to point out. Um, during that CPAP phase, that high phase where there's no flow, that doesn't mean there's uh, no gas exchange. Uh, CO2 will flow down its concentration gradient, and basically you will get a decreased amount of dead space. So during the release breath, that's how we would conven uh, conventionally breathe. But during that high CPAP phase, assuming you're not breathing yourself, it's more like an oscillator. And so you kind of get the best of both worlds here. Um, there have been some fascinating animal studies, again, references are down there at the right, and they've looked at what happens to gas mixing as a result of the heart beating. As the heart beats, it's going to move around and agitate the air. It's going to further help with gas mixing. And what they found is that if you hold a breath and there's no flow and you just allow the heart to kind of agitate the lungs, that during that same amount of time you would have had flow from a conventional breath, you can generate up to uh, 12 to 20 percent of the minute ventilation you would have uh, from traditional breathing. Um, in other words, in humans, your dead space will go down about 53 milliliters because you uh, agitated air to that equivalent with the heart contracting. I should note that this primarily occurs in the dependent lung regions. Another reason it's important to rescue FRC, and it only occurs in the absence of flow. So you're not going to get this cardiogenic uh, mixing with conventional ventilation. Uh, one other study, and this is one of my favorite studies, mechanical ventilation, they took the time where there's no flow at the end of expiration, and they added it to an end inspiratory pause. And so the end inspiratory pause in this study had an addition of 0.7 seconds on it, and it increased the IDE ratio from 1 to 4.7 down to 1 to 1.7. In other words, the inspiratory time and expiratory time became much closer in length to each other. The inspiratory time increased and the expiratory time decreased. And what they found was that their PaCO2 decreased because the amount of dead space had decreased. And so they were overventilating the patients. And so what they did as a follow-on to that 
was decrease the tidal volume, which further decreased the driving pressure as a result of increased compliance, right? So uh, if you take that time of no flow, add it to the end of inspiration, and there's still no flow, but now you've got uh, an open lung that can allow for more gas mixing, that will help with your ventilation as well. So people always think about that extended time at T high as helping oxygenation, and it absolutely does, but it also helps with ventilation. Interestingly, if you look at every APRV study that's, uh, almost every APRV study that's ever been done, the APRV arm has a lower minute ventilation and simultaneously a lower PaCO2. The reason why I would suggest is because you've decreased the dead space and you're now ventilating more efficiently. Uh, secretion clearance, one of my favorite things. Uh, if you look at traditional modes, your inspiratory flow is greater than your expiratory flow. And in this study, um, they looked at what happened to secretions. So I had a mock lung, they put some fluid in it, monitored how the fluid moved with different types of breaths. And in traditional ARDSET ventilations, they didn't see any movement of the secretion out of the alveoli up the respiratory tree. But what happens in TCAV is you're going to flip your inspiratory and expiratory flows, so your expiratory flows are greater than your inspiratory. And what that does is it increases the flow out of the lung with each release breath, and with that it carries some of the mucus. So as you go further along the left here, uh, these TCAV graves are using different uh, P lows. And so the one at the far left, where you had the greatest uh, mucus uh, expelled, was with a P low of zero. Uh, here's just two videos um, uh, showing this and the model that they use. This is the conventional mode. You can see they've got their alveoli or their balloons there filled with fluid. I won't waste too much time. You can see there's just a faint bit of light green at the tips of those uh, yellow balloons there at the bottom, but there's really not a lot happening. Compare that to TCAV, where they inflate the lung. And again, this is going to follow the same protocol we've done, where there's a pressure for a prolonged period of time and then a quick, brief release. If you can look at the bottom there in front of those yellow balloons, you can see that there's green moving up the respiratory tree, signaling that mucus is moving out of the out of the lungs. I'll tell you, if you prone somebody and put them on TCAV and they've got a lot of pulmonary edema, expect to do a lot of suctioning. Okay, this is maybe the most important figure I'll show you in the presentation. I uh, took this from uh, Dr. Camparota. He's a brilliant guy, and I think this really helps. Everybody worries about the release volumes in, in TCAF, and understandably so, right? We live in the six mL per kilogram model, but that six mLs per kilogram is fixed. And sometimes the progression of ARDS is such that your lung size is decreased below what would be safe at six mLs per kilogram. So as your lung volume goes down, as your ARDS gets worse, your elastance would also increase. And as I mentioned at the beginning, if you set your PLO at zero and you watch the expiratory flow, it directly relates to the elastance. And that's what we're using to set our TLO. That's what we're using to set our release volume. So as the lung volume gets smaller, elastance gets higher, or compliance gets lower, your release volumes will get smaller and smaller and smaller. In fact, in my experience, usually when I switch someone over to TCAV and they've got severe ARDS, I almost always have less than six mLs per kilogram. But as you recruit the lung back, as you rescue FRC, over time those release volumes can get bigger and bigger and you might get above six mLs per kilogram. Again, people uh, get nervous when that happens, but if you check the driving pressure on those tidal volumes or release volumes greater than six milliliters per kilogram, they are almost always quite safe. One more study here. Uh, they Again, this is uh, that group out of upstate New York. They took a bunch of rats into the, entered their lungs and put them on various types of uh, uh, TCAVs with different T-low cutoffs and various types of ARDSNET uh, PEEP levels. And what they found uh, was something quite striking. In the ARDSNET group and in the TCAV group, when they looked at the lungs under the microscope, uh, again, I showed you that picture earlier where they had the alveoli and then they colored in blue and tried to figure out what was the change. What they found is that at a peep of 24, T low cutoff of 75, or sorry, 25% or 75% of the peak flow, there was only a 0, uh, 20, uh, 0.025% change. Uh, excuse me, I have a code light going on in the background. There was only a very slight change in the amount of area that the alveoli occupied. In other words, the alveoli stayed open at the end of the release. But here's where it gets really interesting. In the ARDSNET protocol group, those animals, uh, again, this is in rats, had a five ml per kilogram tidal volume, 
Whereas in TCAV, they had almost double that at 11 milliliters per kilogram. Yet the alveoli didn't change. So there's quite a discrepancy here between the macro and micro parameters. So what could explain this? Well, if you look at these two lungs, these rat lungs, again, this is from the same group, uh, what you'll see is that this is 10 mLs per kilogram, and this other lung is 12 mLs per kilogram. The difference is that lung on the left is quite diseased and is well below FRC, whereas the lung at the right is quite open and healthy and at or above FRC. Again, if the one on the right were below FRC, that slide before I showed you where you had the decreasing lung volume correlating with the increased elastance, the release volumes would track that and they would be less than what they are here. So um, again, this is important because we always fixate on that 10, uh, sorry, that uh, 6 mL per kilogram tidal volume. But if you zoom in the lungs, you can see that just because it says 6, or here it's 10, doesn't always mean that it's safe for the alveoli. And just because something says it's 10 or 12 here in the TCAV one doesn't mean it's injurious, all right? If you can set that T low at 75%, it's gonna keep those alveoli stable, and the tidal volume, whether it's below or above six mLs per kilogram, should be safe. So again, TCAV is the best low alveolar tidal volume approach here. Okay, I have just a few minutes. This is uh, last thing we'll, we'll finish up with here, and this is the 10,000 foot view, okay? I've gone into the weeds of how to set and use uh, TCAV. I wanna take a step back. In my mind, I think there are three types of approaches currently to mechanical ventilation. There's the resting lung approach or permissive atelectasis. You see this on a lot on ECMO where it's low PEEP and ultra low tidal volumes. Uh, then you have the lung protective approach. This is kind of our standard approach. We're all familiar with this, ARDSnet, varying PEEP and 6 mL per kilogram tidal volumes. And then there's the open lung approach. Open the lung and keep it open. We're all familiar with this. It's really come uh, under uh, a lot of... Uh, uh, people are really looking poorly on this after the ART trial. All right, so uh, where does TCAV fit in all this? Well, I'll tell you, I don't think it fits in any of these things. I think TCAV is its own approach, and I'm going to call it a redemptive lung approach. And again, it's going to follow that model to stabilize the alveoli, then rescue FRC, and monitor the patient's breathing. And now you may hear that and think, uh, you know, that sounds a lot like the open lung approach, open the lung and keep it open. And that's what historically APRV and TCAV have been described as. But I'm gonna submit that it's actually quite different. If you look at an open lung approach, uh, and again, we're gonna use the ART trial here as, a, as an example, what they would do uh, is they would open the lung and keep it open. But in the redemptive lung approach in TCAV, we're gonna switch that. We're gonna keep our alveoli and then open it, uh, then open up the lung. We're gonna keep the alveoli stable and then we're gonna rescue FRC. It seems like semantics, but it's really important. Remember I said the TCAV approach is a judicious lung recruitment maneuver. It recruits over time. It takes a while. We're not gonna blast the lung open with pressure, which again is a big difference here. Um, the open lung approach will use high PEEP in these recruitment maneuvers. The redemptive lung approach or TCAV is gonna have varying levels of P, varying tidal volumes, and uh, we don't really do recruitment maneuvers with TCAF here. It's all one giant big recruitment maneuver if you're starting from a low lung volume. Um, so these parameters aren't really what we're manipulating like we would with an open lung approach. The other key difference is that in an open lung approach, use a lot of pressure for just a little bit of time. But again, TCAV is gonna reverse this. We use just a little bit of pressure, so a little bit increase in your mean airway pressure, but we're gonna do it for a very long period of time. So I think it's really unfair to say that TCAV is the same as an open lung approach. The open lung approach is just trying to get to the point where the lung is open, the alveoli are healthy, and you can extubate someone. That's everybody's goal. It's just doing it from a different, uh, it's just a different strategy. So uh, the resting lung approach, how in the world would TCAV fit in the resting lung approach model? Well. As I talked about before, I think a TCAV approach is uh, sometimes an ultra low alveolar tidal volume approach. As I mentioned before, if the lungs get really restrictive, if there's a lot of elastance and low compliance, you may get very, very small release volumes. You may get very small ultra low tidal volumes. All right, so in some ways, I also think that TCAV can be a resting lung approach. If those alveoli aren't collapsing, if they can be open and stable, then they're gonna be in a resting open state. Okay, this is a lot of stuff. I have nowhere near exhausted the questions I'm sure you all have. There are several other questions I still have, 
Um, I, this is ripe for research. If you guys want to do some, please find me. I love to study any of these things. Uh, but we've hit the limit of our time. And with that, I'll pause and say thank you uh, to the Drager team and happy to answer any questions.